occupying oneself with obscure depths. Hardly was M. LeBlanc seated, when he turned his eyes towards the pallets, which were empty. How is the poor little wounded girl? He inquired. Bad, replied John Drit with a heartbroken and grateful smile, very bad, my worthy sir. Her elder sister has taken her to the Bourbi to have her hurt dressed. You will see them presently. They will be back immediately. Madame Fabantu seems to me to be better, went on M. LeBlanc. Casting his eyes on the eccentric costume of the Jondrette woman. As she stood between him and the door, as though already guarding the exit, and gazed at him in an attitude of menace and almost of combat. She is dying, said Jondrette. But what do you expect, sir? She has so much courage, that woman has. She's not a woman, she's an ox. The Jondrette, touched by his compliment, deprecated it with the affected airs of a flattered monster. You are always too good to me, Monsieur Jondrette. Jondrette? said M. LeBlanc, I thought your name was Fabantu. Fabantu, alias Jondrette, replied the husband hurriedly. An artistic sobriquet. And launching at his wife a shrug of the shoulders which M. LeBlanc did not catch, he continued with an emphatic and caressing inflection of voice. Ah! We have had a happy life together, this poor darling and I. What would there be left for us if we had not that? We are so wretched, my respectable sir. We have arms, but there is no work. We have the will, no work. I don't know how the government arranges that, but, on my word of honor, sir, I am not Jacobin, sir, I am not a Bousingit. A Democrat. 30 I don't wish them any evil, but if I were the ministers, on my most sacred word, things would be different. Here, for instance, I wanted to have my girls taught the trade of paper box makers. You will say to me. What? A trade. Yes. A trade. A simple trade. A breadwinner. What a fall, my benefactor. What a degradation, when one has been what we have been. Alas. There is nothing left to us of our days of prosperity. One thing only, a picture, of which I think a great deal, but which I am willing to part with, for I must live. Item, one must live. While John Drew thus talked, with an apparent incoherence which detracted nothing from the thoughtful and sagacious expression of his physiognomy, Marius raised his eyes, and perceived at the other end of the room a person whom he had not seen before. A man had just entered, so softly that the door had not been heard to turn on its hinges. This man wore a violet knitted vest, which was old, worn, spotted, cut and gaping at every fold wide trousers of cotton velvet, wooden shoes on his feet, no shirt, had his neck bare, his bare arms tattooed, and his face smeared with black. He had seated himself in silence on the nearest bed, and, as he was behind Jondrette, he could only be indistinctly seen. That sort of magnetic instinct which turns aside the gaze, caused M. LeBlanc to turn round almost at the same moment as Marius. He could not refrain from a gesture of surprise which did not escape Jondrette. Ah! I see! exclaimed Jondrette, buttoning up his coat with an air of complaisance, you are looking at your overcoat? It fits me. My faith, but it fits me. Who is that man? said M. LeBlanc. Him! ejaculated Jondrette, he's a neighbor of mine. Don't pay any attention to him. The neighbor was a singular looking individual. However, manufactories of chemical products abound in the Faubourg Saint Marceau. Many of the workmen might have black faces. Besides this, M. Leblanc's whole person was expressive of candid and intrepid confidence. He went on. Excuse me. What were you saying, M. Fabantu? I was telling you, sir, and dear protector, 
reply John Druid placing his elbows on the table and contemplating M. LeBlanc with steady and tender eyes, not unlike the eyes of the boa constrictor, I was telling you, that I have a picture to sell. A slight sound came from the door. A second man had just entered and seated himself on the bed, behind John Druid. Like the first, his arms were bare, and he had a mask of ink or lamp black. Although this man had, literally, glided into the room, he had not been able to prevent M. LeBlanc catching sight of him. Don't mind them, said John Druid, they are people who belong in the house. So I was saying, that there remains in my possession a valuable picture. But stop, sir, take a look at it. He rose, went to the wall at the foot of which stood the panel which we have already mentioned, and turned it round, still leaving it supported against the wall. It really was something which resembled a picture, and which the candle illuminated, somewhat. Marius could make nothing out of it, as John Druid stood between the picture and him. He only saw a coarse dog, and a sort of principal personage colored with the harsh crudity of foreign canvases and screen paintings. What is that? asked M. LeBlanc. John Druid exclaimed. A painting by a master, a picture of great value, my benefactor. I am as much attached to it as I am to my two daughters. It recalls souvenirs to me. But I have told you, and I will not take it back, that I am so wretched that I will part with it. Either by chance, or because he had begun to feel a dawning uneasiness, M. Leblanc's glance returned to the bottom of the room as he examined the picture. There were now four men, three seated on the bed, one standing near the doorpost, all four with bare arms and motionless, with faces smeared with black. One of those on the bed was leaning against the wall, with closed eyes, and it might have been supposed that he was asleep. He was old. His white hair contrasting with his blackened face produced a horrible effect. The other two seemed to be young. One wore a beard, the other wore his hair long. None of them had on shoes. Those who did not wear socks were barefooted. John Druid noticed that M. Leblanc's eye was fixed on these men. They are friends. They are neighbors, said he. Their faces are black because they work in charcoal. They are chimney builders. Don't trouble yourself about them, my benefactor, but buy my picture. Have pity on my misery. I will not ask you much for it. How much do you think it is worth? Well, said M. LeBlanc, looking John Druid full in the eye, and with the manner of a man who is on his guard, it is some signboard for a tavern, and is worth about three francs. John Druid replied sweetly. Have you your pocketbook with you? I should be satisfied with a thousand crowns. M. LeBlanc sprang up, placed his back against the wall, and cast a rapid glance around the room. He had John Druid on his left, on the side next the window, and the John Druid woman and the four men on his right, on the side next the door. The four men did not stir, and did not even seem to be looking on. John Druid had again begun to speak in a plaintive tone, with so vague an eye, and so lamentable an intonation, that M. LeBlanc might have supposed that what he had before him was a man who had simply gone mad with misery. If you do not buy my picture, my dear benefactor, said John Druid, I shall be left without resources. There will be nothing left for me but to throw myself into the river. When I think that I wanted to have my two girls taught the middle class paper box trade, the making of boxes for New Year's gifts. Well, a table with a board at the end to keep the glasses from falling off is required. Then a special stove is needed. A pot with three compartments for the different degrees of strength of the paste. According as it is to be used for wood, paper, or stuff, a paring knife to cut the cardboard, a mold to adjust it, a hammer to nail the steels, pincers, how the devil do I know what all. And all that in order to earn four sous a day. And you have to work fourteen hours a day. And each box passes through the workwoman's hands thirteen times. And you can't wet the paper. And you mustn't spot anything. 
and you must keep the paste hot. The devil, I tell you. Four sous a day. How do you suppose a man is to live? As he spoke, Jondre did not look at M. Leblanc, who was observing him. M. Leblanc's eye was fixed on Jondre, and Jondre's eye was fixed on the door. Marius' eager attention was transferred from one to the other. M. Leblanc seemed to be asking himself. Is this man an idiot? Jondre repeated two or three distinct times, with all manner of varying inflections of the whining and supplicating order. There is nothing left for me but to throw myself into the river. I went down three steps at the side of the bridge of Austerlitz the other day for that purpose. All at once his dull eyes lighted up with a hideous flash. The little man drew himself up and became terrible, took a step toward M. Leblanc and cried in a voice of thunder, that has nothing to do with the question. Do you know me?